Well, thank you so much all for coming and thank you for the invitation. Sure. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And today you can see our topic is this, um, quite a mouthful. Um, there are many acting mm -hmm. here. Um, but let's see, uh, I offered a seven course manual. Hopefully it will do better than what you're having now. Um, you know, like sometimes when I give talks that serious and kind of boring, I'll say I'll take you on a road trip. Then I'll say I have a road map or outline. But this one is a, a soft story, so I hope uh, the manual would uh, be a key to you. So we'll start with this thing, which we're, uh, we'll, I'll give you a few questions for you to answer. This is from actu our actual survey that we do in rural China. And then I'll talk about the WHO guidelines on sodium. And then the current salt, uh, salt consumption situation in China. And then these are the main things where I talk about our salt substitute studies. Mm -hmm. And then this is China Rural House Initiative Salt Reduction Study. And this one, even more S, uh, <laughs> is Salt Substitute and Stroke Study. Um, so in the end, i uh, talk about a little bit policy related work. So let's get started with the appetizer. For most of you, it's sort of like a meat course. These are three sample questions we ask our participants. Um, not for them to answer by themselves, but we ask them because most of them cannot read. So we say, do you, what's the relationship between high salt intake and health? Do you think it worsens health, improves health, or doesn't affect it? Um, I don't know. Not sure. Um, so should I have a show of hands for this <laughs> one, or is this too easy? <laughs> How about this? Number one? Anyone? Number one. Uh, you think uh, high salt intake will worsen the house. How about number two? Anyone? Number three and four? Okay. I'll assume we get 100% for this one. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then we have this question that's made of four parts. Some of them are here just as, uh, you know, uh, dummy questions to confuse them, you know, so that they don't know, always know the right direction. So we say, do you think uh, medicine can help you reduce uh, blood pressure? Of course, we didn't say which kind of medicine. And then the smoking, um, eat less salt, eat more food. So assuming you know uh, this answer. But then um, there is one that's more um, technical. We say, do you know the daily recommended amount? And we give them options. We don't just ask <coughs> them to say one. And uh, I assume this one may stump someone. Anyone? No salt? Two. Okay, that's right. <laughs> 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 this is for, uh, for the right We hand. have two students who work for a summer in, or for a year and with a light leaking in the front. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, there, there is so much research that has been done on sodium and health. Um, so here you can see from this guideline that came out last year from WHO, this is on sodium intake for adults and children. This is their summary recommendation. I won't ask you to read this, but here is the summary. That this is based on, as I said, a lot of evidence, both from observational studies, but more so from uh, clinical trials, a lot of them on blood pressure too. And um, the recommendation is that uh, for WHO, it's a reduction to less than two grams per day of sodium. But you know the salt, uh, a regular bag of salt you buy is sodium chloride. So if you um, convert that, the actual percentage is 39.3% of the salt is sodium. So you do that conversion about 40%, so it's about 5 grams of salt. Um, this is WH recommendation. The, U, uh, the U.S. recommendation is slightly different, I'll show you in a minute. And in China, we're still working on the 6 gram of salt recommendation. And then children, 6 grams or less. Children um, also should reduce their sodium intake, but to less than the maximum is different for, for them according to their age and their weight. So this is primarily based on evidence from the benefit of a lower salt diet on um, blood pressure, heart disease, uh, and stroke and kidney disease. So primarily from blood pressure because we don't have direct evidence on the heart outcomes yet. And then in the U.S., this is the 2010 um, dietary guidelines. The government is working on the U.S. government is working on the 2015 version, and you can see this is slightly different. The WHO is 20,000 milligrams. The U.S. Uh, most of you probably know this. The general population is 23 milligrams, corresponding to maybe 5.5 or so gram of salt. And then for these people, children, uh, older adults, African Americans, have those with hypertension, diabetes, CKD. It's only 1,500 milligrams per day. 
Hasn't there been recent uh, a recent controversy about the uh, the restriction of salt to really low levels and that it could be doing more harm than good? Yes, the controversy uh, has always been there and recently sometimes heated up by recent publications. Um, that's why we do our SACS trial, which is the salt substitute and stroke trial. Mm -hmm. um, however, the recommendation is based on evidence for blood pressure and um, this level is considered safe even for this special population and the recommendation is not to have no salt or extremely low level of salt. So that no salt answer is, is wrong. You've got to have some salt for your health. So um, different from tobacco. Mm -hmm. But this is, um, the dietary guideline also noticed that this population is close to half of all the people in the US. So it has a very large population. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so now that we are done with the appetizer for the salad, I'd like to talk to you about the salt consumption in China. Many of you, I assume, you may not know. Um, you can see the right hand side first. The top one is salt, the bottom one is sodium. They are similar. So this is the recommended, WHO recommended, or oh, the China recommended um, limit. This is for sodium. You can see for China, this is the total population. This is urban, this is rural is way above the limit. For um, the country, our consumption is about double the six gram recommendation from the Chinese uh, Nutrition Society. For the country, it's about 12. And in northern China, people eat a saltier diet just because of the tradition and the way people eat than the southern China. So for northern China, the average is about 15, uh, 14 to 15, and the southern China is about 10 to 11. That's how we get the average of about 12. And then in northern China, in particular, those who live in rural areas eat a higher salt diet than those who live in the cities. So um, this is also why we work in northern rural China a lot on the salt reduction issue. And you can see this um, based on the data back in 2006. This is China, about 12. And um, if you can't read Chinese, so you don't have a hint of what this country is, but do you have a guess? Which one may be higher than China? The clue is that it's in Asia. Japan? Japan is a good guess. Japan is right here. Japan used to have a very high salt intake, um, but they've been successful to reduce it, and we believe that relates to their success story in reducing stroke too. Mm -hmm. This one actually is our neighbor too, is South Korea. Mm -hmm. Um, all right, so salt consumption in this special region of Tibet that we also um, did some work is amazingly high. Chris knows more about this than I do. Actually, he's one who found this reference. Um, there, there's lack of data from representative samples, so we don't know for sure the true average um, salt consumption for this population, but some references say about 24 grams a day. Can you imagine? And our trial, we did a trial of 282 people that I'll talk briefly about later. Um, then a subset of the people we have actual data on their cell intake, a small sample, but it's really high as well. And it's mostly due to the yak butter tea they drink. It's sort of like a, a tea, it has tea, it has butter, and they add a lot of salt to it. Um, and then the meat yeah. they eat that are pure in a different way. Now, okay, the sources of sodium, this is one important piece of information we need to know in order to know our salt reduction strategy. For example, in most developed countries, actually I think including most of you here, the main source of your sodium is from processed food. Not necessarily any chili dinners you buy, but noodles, pasta, bread, any things you buy from the store, those are considered processed food, and that's about 70 to 80 percent of your salt intake. So, in order to reduce the salt intake in countries like the U.S., what do we do? We work with the industry for them to reduce the salt they put in the food that you eat. But for China, you can see salt added during cooking, mostly um, the housewives cook at home, is a major <coughs> source. So we need to work with the population but also with the industry because the proportion of processed food is on the rise in China on salt reduction. So now, move on to the first course. Um, you know, these things are quicker. Then, um, 
I'd like to talk to you about the salt substitutes, given the background I gave you. I did bring two samples. You can see this is that. Um, and I have this one. You can open it and see. Um, just a conclusion, this one looks pretty much like regular salt. But can you help open them so people can pass around? But be careful, I didn't bring you know, cups. So you can take a look inside. You can add to your lunch if you want. <laughs> um, and then this one is a mushroom salt. It's uh, made by a private industry, private company. And the mushroom salt looks a little yellower. So you can tell it's different from regular salt. This is made by our national company. It's a low sodium, um, high potassium salt. And I looked on the internet just before I did give this talk over the weekend, and I did find a lot of, oh, why is this opposite? Anyway, um, it's upside down. It's the, this is molten, this is new salt. You do have this available in the US, but my guess, have you ever bought it, heard about it? Oh, tell me. Oh, good. So this is a, indeed a very health conscious crowd. <laughs> um, so I'm not going to talk too much about it, but you can see the salt substitute works in the way that it decreases the sodium chloride from 100% to 65%. And it increases the potassium chloride um, usually up to 25%. This is the National Salt Company's composition. And they have about 10% of magnesium. Magnesium doesn't have a blood pressure lowering effect, but the lowering of sodium helps reduce the blood pressure and the increase of potassium. There is a guideline on potassium intake for adults and children too. There is controversy regarding this as well, but the consensus is that um, increased potassium to the right amount helps those uh, with low potassium to reduce their blood pressure. And of note, in rural China, northern China in particular, including Tibet, people's diet has a very low fresh fruit and fresh vegetable intake, and this is the main source of potassium. So the sodium to potassium ratio in a typical northern China farmer is very high. It's, um, it could be anywhere from three to seven, so the more sodium to potassium, but that ratio should be much lower. So this is how the salt substitute works to lower blood pressure. So we had a few studies. Um, Many of them actually were done before I went to George, so I'm going to give the full presentation uh, acknowledgement list later. So this is in no way representing my own work, um, as is the case in many uh, uh, public health studies. So I'll talk to you about the CSSS and the pulse wave sub study and the TASTE study. Um, if you're brave enough, feel free to try a little. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know, if you just try it like that, it's probably doesn't taste too good. And then we did a study in Tibet and the Mandanao. So this is the study um, that was done uh, a little while ago. Uh, we enrolled about 600 families. Uh, each family has one index high-risk patient. And we gave all the families free salt, either free salt substitute or free regular salt. And this is a um, double-blinded randomized controlled trial. And then after the running period, the randomization uh, and the mutilation lasted for one year. So this is the criteria for the high risk. What, what was the run-in for? Um, just to make sure people are okay with eating the salt. The salt substitute. Yeah, this is the first salt substitute study we did, and we gave them free salt substitutes for them to eat and for them to, to see whether they could continue with our regimen, which is continue eating our salt for a year. And free regular salt you didn't think would increase the likelihood of using more salt? That is possible. That is indeed a risk. In fact, the risk is higher for salt substitutes because some people think, we don't tell them, but it's possible that they just lower, they think if they need to add more in their cooking in order to reach the same saltiness, which <coughs> probably is not true. So there is such a risk, yeah. yeah. But it, it's in a double-blinded, randomized session. So um, we had to run in, um, you know, the blood pressure chain. But then um, this is the salt substitute group, and this is the regular salt group. In a nutshell, in the end of the 12 months follow-up, there was a net reduction of about 4.4 millimeter mercury, and these 
three time period with the star is where the difference was, was significant. So um, this study was one of the bigger studies on salt substitute, but not the only one. Um, so I'll show you some meta-analyses. In the sub-study of that 600 uh, patient population, uh, this included about 187 people. And uh, there was this pulse wave analysis done. And you can see that uh, there were reductions um, in systolic blood pressure and diastolic, but uh, only significant for systolic. I'm not a clinician, so don't ask me on explaining all of these different measures. Um, but you can see for most of the measures that uh, it shows a net reduction in how actually the arterial vessels work. Um, this is uh, a potentially um, one important piece of work to show the mechanisms of how a lower uh, sodium hyperpotassium product and how people lower their blood pressure. This is the taste, the study on taste and acceptability. Uh, on the left hand side is the usual home prepared food people cook with our products. It's not our products, it's the national product that we use in our study. And then this is a standard salty soup that the study prepared for them to taste. You can see it with one small, with one exception, there is a significant difference between the two products, the regular salt versus the salt substitutes. Um, for most measures, uh, they are they're not different. And our trial that lasted for 12 months, the compliance was similar uh, between the two groups. So uh, it's pretty well tolerated. Now this study in Shabbat only lasted for three months and it's a single blinded trial because of the many difficulties of doing uh, a double blinded trial in this condition. Uh, it included 282 families and um, this is only hypertensive patients and you can see in this place where salt intake is higher and blood pressure is a bigger problem, high blood pressure is a bigger problem, we saw a bigger reduction. Because it's only three months, we believe there were seasonal variations in blood pressure levels. So for both the salt substitute group, the darker bars, and the control group, the regular salt group, the lighter, I'm oh sorry, this is the control group. Um, but uh, this is the this is the uh, intervention group. This is the control group. In the lighter bars is the regular salt. They both had reductions over the three months, but the net differences for systolic blood pressure was 7.1 millimeter mercury according to the intention to treat analysis that included all of the 800 uh, 282 people, um, and for diastolic is 2.8 net difference, which is also significant. And when we did our per protocol analysis, that included 230 people. By per protocol, I mean they did not substitute uh, to use other salts that we didn't provide them. Some of uh, it, it was a higher proportion of Tibetan participants that used other salts than the northern China uh, participants, <laughs> potentially because our products look uh, are different from the other products that we use, especially when they make tea, they feel they can taste the difference. Some participants report to us mm -hmm. that's why they use different salt. So when we did that, um, the difference was bigger. For those who uh, followed the protocol, there was about 8.6 molecular mercury difference. And it's, interesting, it's important to note that about 5 millimeter mercury reduction is what you can expect from one single drug regimen. And this mm -hmm from eight to 10 is about what you can get from two drug combination. So we did a meta-analysis. We find out um, about, uh, we, in the end, after the um, following the protocol, there were 11 trials that fulfilled our requirement of, uh, they were uh, randomized controlled trials on salt substitute, different kind of compositions versus regular diet. So um, you, I don't expect you to read the whole thing, but this is the overall effect on systolic blood pressure in this diamond, and this one favors salt substitute, this one favors control, and you can see overall uh, of all of the event trials, the difference, the effect size is 7.39 um, millimeter mercury. Um, this is significant at the 0.05 level. 
and you can see for diastolic, it overall is 2.7, also significant. And I have, did I skip overall? I skip. This is the subgroup analysis. Again, very small to me, but by age groups, <laughs> um, by the duration of the study, by their hypertension status, or by the composition of how much sodium still left in there. Um, I think the overall message I'd like you to take from this graph is that it's fairly consistent across different subgroup analyses for both systolic and diastolic. And then for nine studies, we had data on heart outcomes. So the top one is cardiovascular events, um, and then uh, including these are non fatal, uh, MI and stroke, and this is uh, mortality. Again, this is, sorry, small for you to read, but <coughs> this is exploratory only and emphasized. This is not definite evidence because all trials are not designed to evaluate heart outcomes. And most of these results were driven by one large Taiwanese study that were done in the nursing homes and they had results on mortality uh, on the larger numbers. So uh, we find that of these outcomes we evaluated, uh, one is significant, uh, which is this one on um, overall cardiovascular death. But again, take this with a grain of salt. <laughs> this is important. <laughs> um, all right, so let's move on to um, the study um, that we did in rural China. So just a little bit of background on NCDs. Um, I think all of you are pretty uh, aware of the version of NCDs, and this is published late last year in Lancet uh, using the 2010 Global Burden of Disease data. You can see that for the whole world, the ranking using this measure, years of life lost, um, as uh, one indicator of disease burden, from 1990 to 2010, over 20 years, the ranking of IHD, skin heart disease, and stroke went up to be number one and number three for the whole world. And the top two is lower respiratory inf uh, infection, infection. Right, so we have the same data for China. Anyone have a guess what's top three for China? So for China, uh, from 1990 to 2010, this is the current ranking, is stroke and IHD and COPD. So um, this is similar to some Asian countries, but dissimilar from Western countries, where usually heart disease is a bigger burden than stroke. So this graph also is kind of colorful, but I'm using this to show a message that rural China in terms of the burden of NCDs is having a similar burden with urban China or bigger burden. So this is heart disease, um, this is stroke, this is heart disease, um, this is cancer, and this is respiratory disease. About 80% of all deaths come from NCDs in China. This is true both for urban and rural China. So it's not a condition limited to wealthy, wealthier places or uh, organization only. Now, here's the, what we have from our actual survey done in 2010 in rural population. These questions I asked you, so the, this is the first one I call you the harm. And you can see over half of them knew high salt was bad for them. Uh, still about 43% didn't know or, or was wrong. And then in terms of whether eating less salt is good for reducing blood pressure, only 32% was correct. And 5% of them knew that it was less than 6 grams. <coughs> now, so for China Rural Health Initiative, this is a uh, study that we designed in order to achieve the overall goal of evaluating low cost and hopefully effective sustainable interventions for CBD prevention in rural China. And you can see from the title that there were two parts in our study. One is a high risk based approach where we train village doctors to better manage 
the high-risk patients in their village to screen them out and manage them well. And then there is another, which is a population-based. This is what I what we can think of as the two legs for pu public health interventions: the high-risk approach and population-based approach. The sodium reduction is a population-based approach, uh, where I'll talk more about today. It is done in five provinces and ten counties. Uh, 12 townships from each county and one village from each township. So if you do the math, we have 120 townships from all of the 10 counties, um, equaling to 120 villages. Now, this is a cluster randomized controlled trial because we need to train the village doctors, we need to implement village-wide activities, so we randomize at the township level, uh, and then we get the village randomized that way. The reason that we couldn't do a village level randomization is that in the same township there may be about 12 to 20 villages and they are managed um, by the same township healthcare centers and many of the village doctors, they know each other, they meet in monthly in their training and then if the village if we randomize two villages <coughs> next to each other, one in the intervention, one in the control, there may be more contamination going on. So we have 120 villages from uh, 10 counties in our study. Randomized for the salt reduction is one-to-one -one fashion, so 16 in infection villages. And what we do in the intervention? Um, we deliver the community-based health education and promotion. I'm sorry, I need to check on my time. Oh, there is a clock. Oh, good, good. Um, so there is a health education component. We need to let people know, you know, eating a high salt diet is bad for you, why lower salt is good for you, and how you can do that. And we also offer this uh, low sodium salt so that people can buy them. Even though this product that you see, the made by the, the plastic bag, is available in Chinese market for about um, 20 years and is nationally approved, but the uptake is very low. And up until now, it's only available in cities, um, especially large cities. So they're not available in the rural villages that they live in. So we ship the salt substitutes so that they're available in the convenience stores in the 60 intervention villages. Um, and also for half, so three in each county, a total of 30 villages, we give them a price subsidy. Salt is not an expensive product. So the regular salt, a bag is uh, 500 grams, and it costs about uh, one yuan, which is about a quarter dollar. And then the salt substitute, um, usually in 400 gram bags, it costs about uh, 1.8 yuan. So about if you convert, it's about double the price. Still, it's affordable. You know, even if they have a very high salt intake. So how much, how many bags do they need for a month? And this affordable even for most families. But um, people are very price conscious. You know, if it's more expensive and they don't see the benefit, why do I buy it? So we uh, have this economic measure in there where we make them the same price. It's not free, but they're the same price as the regular salt. So with the health education, hopefully they know they're buying a better product with the price. So um, then the primary outcome is so I'm glad most of you are done with eating. <laughs> it's collected from 24-hour urine. Um, then uh, we can then measure the sodium, potassium, um, and creatinine and other measures from the urinary sample. And this is a considered a gold standard to measure um, sodium intake. Because you can imagine how hard it is to actually measure your sodium intake in your diet. Uh, it can come from salt comes from processed food, it comes from many of the sauces, sauces in cooking that we add, you know, chili sauces, soy sauce, uh, and other things. So this is not easy to do, but it provides a pretty good measure of the sodium uh, amount. And then we have a number of secondary outcomes, 24-hour urinary uh, potassium excretion and this ratio that we know is very high in China, and then the mean levels uh, of blood pressure uh, as well as proportion with hypertension. <coughs> so you may think we have a very large study. Yes, we do. We have 120 villages. If we be believe that we have a big reach in terms of our health education reaching everyone in the village, on average 2,000 people in each village, 
and we have 60 intervention villages that we're talking about um, over 100,000 people that we're reaching. However, mm -hmm. this is a cluster randomized trial. So even though we have a large number of people in each cluster, um, the overall power is driven by many factors, including number of clusters. So we don't really have the power on um, hard outcomes. And so, but we would be able to evaluate um, to urinary outcomes and blood pressure. Now, uh, a few photos to show you uh, of the um, health education that we did. Uh, this is the kickoff meetings. Uh, this is the China Rural Health Initiative in Chinese. And we have standardized slogan for people. Uh, this is done at different places. You can see a glimpse of this posters uh, which I gave you a bigger picture here, the poster number one, two, three. This is the um, education. You can read Chinese, most of you cannot, but um, you have a guess of what we're talking about here, right? <laughs> right? And then this is to show them um, the high salt, in salt high sal the food in high salt, food with high salt. Um, basically trying to uh, tell them how to reduce salt. And so this is the why, this is the how, and this is um, low sodium products. Uh, I have I don't have the one that's national because each province has their own salt company that's subsidiaries of the national company and they produce their own package according to the same national standard. And uh, we gave them calendars so they can post on their walls. Uh, this is low salt low sodium salt sticker. This is a salt bottle sticker that they can put on now we uh, have a small group interactive sessions where the township health educators will teach the villagers uh, you know, about why higher salt is bad for you and how you can reduce salt intake. This is um, one of the activity we did with the ch uh, primary school children. We asked them to write some essays or draw pictures um, so that they can learn better and also influence their parents, grandparents maybe. So this is a sample of that. Now, the current status is that we did the training of the health educators. First, we trained those in the, town, in the county level and then they trained their own township health educators. This was done in um, two months, April to May of 2011. And the intervention began right after this with the kickoff meeting. Um, the whole intervention lasted one and a half years, and it was over uh, in September of last year. And we did our um, post-intervention surveys and other evaluations uh, in the fall of last year. And right now, we're currently um, doing our data cleaning. And I'm sorry to say, because of the timing, I won't be able to give you actual results. It will be uh, presented in the AHA uh, um, November 17th and it's embargoed until then. Um, this, but this is the questionnaire that we did. Uh, some of the questions you saw in that uh, the salt related questions we did over 6,000 people. The 24 hour urine were collected on the sub sample because according to our power analysis this would be enough to, to show the difference. We also collected dry blood spot uh, data you, it's through a finger prick, you can put it on the test papers, um, and this is uh, an ancillary study. So now, let's talk about uh, another study, the last one I'll show you, on salt substitute and stroke. Now here is the title. And you know <coughs> that th this is related to the controversy that Liz has to leave uh, for another meeting that she raised on this question about the controversy. Indeed, um, this has been, there has been a big controversy regarding the direct effect of salt reduction on heart outcomes, things like heart disease, stroke, uh, fatal or non-fatal, uh, death. There is no trial so far in the whole world on this. And we could extrapolate, we could say, okay, we know so sodium reduction works for reducing blood pressure, no controversy regarding this. The evidence is very compelling. And we know blood pressure lowering you know, could lead to better heart outcomes. But there are evidence in, for example, some drug trials that you know, this lowered blood pressure, but it, it had no effect on heart outcomes. Mm -hmm. So people could say this last extrapolation may not work. And also, 
there are uh, different uh, nuances about for different population, what's the right level, etc. So um, then, this controversy, uh, I didn't, you know, put together a lot of uh, the previous analyses, but basically. Um, the meta-analyses, there were also published meta-analyses on mortality using the blood pressure trials because for one study the size is too small but if you put together a lot still um, it's, the, it's inconclusive and controversy. Some studies showed as expected, some studies show no, it actually didn't have any relation. Some studies showed it's actually bad. So um, the current status is that there's no, no trial on salt and heart outcomes to date. And we were fortunate that uh, we were able to uh, get started. This one is a new study. We're just uh, going to submit IRB um, three days from now. So it is in the preparation stage. The focus here is on uh, using salt substitutes as a mean of actually achieving a lower sodium diet. I think you can relate. If you're used to a high salt diet, it's so hard to switch your taste and back to a lower size. It could be done, but unless you're really health conscious and everything, it may not be that easy. So, but salt substitutes provide a way of actually supplying it to the patients and they can reach, achieve a long-term reduction in their sodium intake. So we're using the salt substitute. And in terms of the outcome, we're focusing on stroke. Um, because um, not only to become, not only to achieve better power, but also because stroke is a higher burden. You have seen that it's the number one, um, it ranks the number one in terms of causes of death and years of life loss. You can also see from this worldwide map. This is China. Uh, this is in Mo This is Mongolia. Uh, this is um, Soviet. This is Russia. Uh, and then this is the highest level where um, the world has it. And pretty uh, severe burden in, the, uh, in Africa too. And then in terms of the economic burden, especially in rural China, it's pretty high. This is uh, different cities ranked by the growth um, regional product, which is a measure of their local economic level from low to high. You can see this is level three hospitals, which is the tertiary hospitals. And the cost of one hospital treatment may be about 10 to 14 days of inpatient treatment for acute stroke, cost about 12,000 yuan, which is higher than the median annual income for a rural family. And if you go to a level two hospitals, these are hospitals located in their county, um, you see a difference of in charge by their level of economic development. You don't really see that in here, in the level three. So you see that here. So it costs you less if you're from the poorer areas. But still, the overall mean is about two-thirds of your annual income for one hospitalization. So in this study, we um, set out to define the effect of salt substitutes, which combines sodium reduction and potassium enrichment on the risk of fatal and non fatal on stroke, and the secondary outcome is on major vascular event and total mortality. Now, this is also a large-scale cluster randomized trial. We had discussions about doing double-blinded individualized trial like what we did in the 600 family study, but to do that um, and to achieve the power we have, it's even more difficult logistically than doing this cluster randomized trial. So in the end, the design was to uh, include 600 clusters in our, village, in our study. And from each cluster, we recruit 35 patients only. And in the intervention group, we will supply free salt substitutes. And in the control group, we do nothing. We don't give them free salt. So in other words, in 300 villages, after we recruit 35 patients from each village, we give all of the patients free supply of salt substitutes for their whole family. So a lot of salt. Um, is it about 100, 1,600 pounds over five years or so? A lot of salt substitutes to supply. But then um, this is a way that we can easily 
we can administer this study through the village doctors, so we supply the study to them and they give to the 35 families. Um, we can also conduct the health education through them. Um, and then the most crucial thing in this whole study, other than conducting this as designed well, is to uh, have an objective measure of the outcome of fatal and non-fatal events. So we will rely on independent third party to do this. Um, by independent, they're not completely independent, but certainly we wouldn't let the village doctors tell us who has to or who are not, um, who are in the intervention. It's not the team members that are doing the study. So we will work with our local collaborators in the five provinces so that they hire medical students to make phone calls. Um, because of the technology, they could make online phone calls, it's cheap, and we could report their phone calls randomly and check on their quality. And we also, we randomly assign patients to them to call. So they don't know necessarily, of course, they could ask and find out. But um, we do as best as we can so that they don't know who they're called, you know, which group of the patients come from. So they may have, uh, they may call every half a year so we can get the outcome um, fatal and non-fatal uh, stroke from these patients. And in case we cannot reach them through the calls, it is, um, you must know that China is the biggest country for cell phone use. Uh, it is true for rural China as well, but many older people don't have a cell phone themselves. Uh, the current estimate is that for those older than 60, maybe only a third. But they usually can have access to another person's cell phone. So if we need to reach them, we call the other person so they can go to his phone to be um, interviewed. Um, or uh, we can then, for the proportion that we couldn't reach by phone, then there will be home visits. So this is the same five provinces that we're working in. Um, as I said, we're submitting IRB this Thursday. Um, this is a summary of, of the designs. The province wide, two counties, 24 townships, 120 villages total, and randomization stratified by county, and 35 people from each village. So in the end, we would have 21,000 high-risk individuals um, receiving um, salt substitutes. Half of them receiving salt substitutes for their whole family. So uh, 10,500 in an intervention, and the other half in the control. And in terms of the um, actual measurements we did, uh, this is the recruitment criteria. The excluding criteria not listed here, and then our outcomes, uh, as well as uh, the planned surveys. For a subsample, where we'll check on their uh, sodium uh, as well as blood pressure during the uh, period of the study. So um, that's the main course. Uh, ready for some dessert? <laughs> um, here, this is published in uh, July. No, actually in May of 2011. You recall that the year of 2011 was big for NCDs because in September there was a UN high-level meeting on NCDs. And this high-level meeting on health was only the second on health of, of the high-level meetings. And the first one was on AIDS, HIV AIDS, about 10 years ago. So before that high-level meeting, there was a publication in Lancet from a group of many influential uh, researchers. and they listed the cost effective, the cost effective interventions for low and middle income countries to combat uh, NCDs. And you can see salt reduction uh, is listed as the second one, right after um, tobacco control. So um, in China, there are a lot of, um, I wouldn't say a lot of actual work going on already, but a lot of momentum to push for actual work for bigger salt reduction effort in China. So there was a consensus put out in March 2011. So we work uh, with China CDC, ICDC, uh, and the industry. Um, is this initiative is led now by China CDC uh, to push for nationwide salt and, uh, reduction. And in the city of Beijing, uh, they have a Healthy Beijing 2020 campaign, and they also 
started promoting salt substitutes based on existing evidence, even though our trials on heart outcome wouldn't be completed until a few years down the line. And for example, the bag I show you, I don't know where it is now, it, it, it says 75 grams for free from the Beijing government. So you pay for the regular price of 400 grams, but you get 475 grams uh, for free, so that's um, to promote the use of salt substitute. I did not, I saw news releases about this promotion. I saw them in the um, supermarkets and they feature them in the easy to see places, for example, but I don't have actual data on how effective this campaign is for more people buying salt substitutes. I certainly did, but I'm not <laughs> sure about uh, the actual results. And then, for example, in May 2013, uh, there was this commission that they published on salt reduction and health promotion. Um, including the salt company uh, and then the Chinese food and oils for that company, etc. So, and many other things that were, uh, many smaller initiatives that were done. So, uh, in summary, high salt intake is a major modifiable risk factor for NCDs, especially uh, in countries where high salt, uh, where salt intake is high. And salt substitutes potentially is a cost-effective approach in low and middle income countries. Not necessarily so in developed countries for the reasons I uh, talked about before. And then there are evidences, evidence from randomized controlled trials demonstrating the effect of salt substitutes on blood pressure. Um, and then our study in rural China evaluated the community-based salt reduction intervention. Um, we uh, will be able to publicize the results in a few months. And there's a new study, very exciting. Um, I think it's no exaggeration to say that this is once in a lifetime opportunity <laughs> to be able to evaluate the effect of salt on heart outcomes. Uh, so that's the fast track. All right, um, as I said, this is only a partial list of um, the collaborators on this study, in particular, Professor Bruce Neal from the George Institute in Australia and Professor Yang Feng Wu from George China. They played key leadership roles in um, these studies. And then um, this is our local partner. Ah, my other slide, huh? Anyway, there, there is a slide for that I recently added for the sponsors uh, of the studies. Um, namely, um, many US institutions such as NHLVI, United Health Groups, USCDC, uh, and Medtronic Foundation. So, um, for which we are really grateful. So this is my email, you can get in touch. Sorry, I didn't um, receive many questions other than this and a few others. So feel free to um, ask any questions you may have. How many people you have in that book study, that last study? How many, how big a team you have doing that project? Mm. Ah, that's a very good question. Uh, we're expecting, uh, well, the team is at different levels. In Beijing, we only so far have a team of, a core team, not company investigators, a core team of four people for now. And it will expand into about six or seven. This is in Beijing. But then in each local, in each provinces, we expect to have a team of about 25 in each province. We also have a team in the county. And this is not counting all of the village doctors that will work with us, that's 600 of them. Randy, yeah, and thank you. Yes. So the, that study where you're collecting data over five years, presumably during that time period, some of your research subjects are going to die. Yeah. Will you be able to determine the cause of death? <coughs> Very good question. I didn't talk about this detail. Um, this is something really cool that we also piloted. There is a tool called verbal autopsy, which <coughs> basically means you ask the next of kin of the decedent, deceit of those who died, um, a bunch of symptom questions. And then we use, then softwares will be used instead of asking the physicians of which cause of death that they died from. And uh, this has been going on for a few decades, mostly uh, in low and middle income countries. But we were able to do this in 48 villages of uh, two provinces in the CRHI on a smartphone based interview. So uh, we made it easier um, to train the interviewer and for the interviewer to follow the protocol because most, because they're not medical trained personnel. Even though it's symptoms, it's easier to train them. 
And the initial results from that um, 48 village study has been out and will be presented. It's uh, pretty feasible and we could assign the cost of death or relatively accurately. And there was also a shorter version available. It was piloted in Vietnam, but now we will use it in this last trial. So for anyone who dies, we will use this to see the cost of death. Because a lot of them actually die in, at home. They don't die in the hospital in rural China. And you, and then uh, Professor Tan, and then uh, just uh, one question, one comment. Um, the question is, is there any other countries right now that's going to do similar trials, especially in Africa maybe? Or similar trials in uh, uh, substitutes? Salt, salt substitutes, and yeah, in other parts of the world. Um, because I'm curious as to what the results will look like in a different part of the world, seeing that there's so many yeah. factors. And also salt sub substitutes sounds like it's, it's very specific to certain regions of yeah. the world where people actually consume salt in that fashion. But yeah. what about again, your other countries, even if it's a developing country that's consuming salt through processed foods or whatever, so it's... I think you asked two main questions. Yeah. The first one is to say uh, uh, the trial in other regions. Are you talking about the salt substitute on heart outcomes? Or are you Not talking about just salt uh, reduction uh, in general? In general, yeah. Yeah, we are actually, um, because of our work on salt, we are um, aware of many efforts. There is one study in Peru that's funded by the Global Alliance for Chronic Disease evaluating salt substitute in their communities. And there is a uh, researcher from the Netherlands who works in Kenya who got in touch with us to do salt reduction there and also Mongolia, etc. Uh, yes, there are efforts uh, in different regions. And we need to work, we need to use different strategies. So this relates to your second question, which is talking about if we talk about salt reduction intervention approaches in general, there are um, different ways to do it. Using salt substitute is one way. It's only one aid. I'm not saying this is cure for all. This is only one aid where it may be effective when people's uh, sodium comes from added salt, uh, mostly through the cooking. If you add the salt at the table, again, the taste may be different. Mm. So that's one potential aid. And then I talk about working with the industry. Uh, there is an organization called WASH, World Action on Salt and Health. Um, it's led by Professor um, Graham McGregor and Professor Bruce New and others. Um, it's an organization with members in many countries and then they work with each country to promote um, salt reduction. They, they've been doing this in the UK. It's called um, CASH, uh, I think it's, it's Coalition on salt and, and health in the UK and they, their results of the 10 years effort in salt reduction showed about a, my memory, don't quote on me, don't quote me on it, maybe about one to two grams of reduction, which is very significant even though it doesn't look so. Um, and then in Australia there is the AWASH, Australian uh, health, you know, salt and health that led by Professor Neil and others. So the approach would need to be multi-sectoral and multifaceted to work with government and the industry and the media and the public. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, thank you very much for your very interesting uh, presentation. I want to actually look at uh, this NCD in China from bigger pictures. As you said, the Chinese, particularly from northern part of China, eat lots of sorted food. That has not been changed 100 years. And the price of salt is always cheap. Uh, but the NCD premium rates for instance, increased significantly over the last two or three decades. So what makes this you know, rapid rise of NCD in China? It's probably not salt, right? It's, it's, it's <laughs> salt is it's, it's salted, it's salted, but always uh, there. You know, for, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I just found out why people didn't think I uh, didn't examine the rapid change of diet in, in Chinese and Chinese populations. And one is an increased uh, uptake of the vegetable oil mm -hmm. yeah. and the fatty food. When I was a child, or before economic reform launched in China in the late 70s, early 90s, the uh, vegetable oil is a rich. I remember that per person, per month, got say less than 200 grams. Yeah. So, um, Chinese 
people get used to eat a very little, you know, with oils or in their cookings. And also the fact if, you know, at that time people poor, didn't have uh, lots of meat or any stuff. So maybe I'm pondering, you know, maybe it probably the increased, you know, uptake of vegetable oils or eating fatty food probably is uh, more critical than the salt over the last uh, one or two decades. So I just wonder whether or not intervention in salt, of course, is useful. But in terms of prioritize these interventions, which one should come first? This is the bigger policy issues. <laughs> I just want to take up for debate and discussion. Well, last question, excellent question. Would you like to? Yeah, actually, I think that's why it's, it's a probably a big push for this healthy eating overall. Yeah. It's yeah. a comprehensive yeah. measure yeah. of healthy eating. Yeah. You said that when you think about that, it's a less uh, a consumption of fat uh, food, less, uh, less consumption of salt, yeah. Then, like less consumption of uh, kind of oil, kind of all these kind of uh, measures. That's a comprehensive measures. But also, well, as a gerontologist, I would think that that you have increasing number of older adults. That also the compounding factors for increase of uh, NCD prevalence. So that's uh, put all these into perspective. That's but certainly the salt is one measure of yeah. doing this. It's very, it's very useful. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'm glad you answered the question. <laughs> <laughs> but the question is excellent and it's harder to answer than just your reply. Yeah. Uh, I think, uh, you know, given the interest of time, I would say that uh, definitely I agree with you. I think if we do this uh, trend analysis, the increase in fat and oil and sugar intake plus the decrease in physical activity, these are probably the lifestyle factors affecting the rise in NCDs more so than salt. Um, having said that, salt is one way, salt reduction is one way we can work at to reduce the burden. Uh, also because uh, it looks like salt substitute is a feasible and cost effective way. Talking about reducing fat intake, oil intake, increasing physical activity, I'm not saying it's not good, we shouldn't do, we definitely should do, and in future studies we may incorporate those. But we did, with the, we, with the support from the Luxembourg, uh, when I was in the British channel, we did do, do, do reduce you know, uh, vegetable oil taking yeah. in Sanzong. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, I'm going to thank you, you can keep going. Thanks a lot. Yeah. <laughs>